Um, I. Yeah. Oh, I have to look in that camera, or I can doesn't just look. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll be moving around adjusting the mics. Well, officially, my name is um, Paul Brookhausen, and uh, I was I was adopted and was placed in orphanage after my mom got uh, raped. And um, what I had. Well, everybody has an amazing story. Yeah, it's just everybody does. everybody does. It's I'm not more unique than anybody else. It's just maybe I'm a person who's not who doesn't care what other people think about me because people always have. And all these people who think there is no purpose, they are locked up in their mind with definitions. And I will never. I don't want to judge it, but probably I do. <laughs> <laughs> but we are not a mind, and some people do not believe that we have a soul. Or, but if you don't have a soul, then there is also no feelings of love. If we have a mind, then there is no love. Then there is no hate. There's nothing. And there's. I mean, then what? Is, then there is automatically makes this makes all no sense. And because there is such an intense feeling of love and what it is, it's there is more. And I don't know exactly what is there, but it's very interesting to go into your own investigations. And yeah. what it, what inspired you? It's I it. I can see it's more than card counting and oh yeah. being emotionally distant because you're just playing the odds. Uh, you're giving me a vision now. Uh, that most people don't see in regular society. You know, watching TV, you don't get an idea of what you're talking about. Where did you get it? And you don't take drugs? No. Or just those two precious times you took the mushrooms? Yeah. Where, where did, I mean, you know, we know your mom didn't take you to church, or maybe you're, no, uh, you're no, adopted. No, that is very funny. Uh, we talk about, because that is, I do believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not belief, it's not in my head, like, I go to church. I'm going to a very interesting church because it's a church where people are just dancing and singing and being together and it's actually a very famous football player, uh, Reindels, he was a quarterback for the Philadelphias, mm -hmm. for the Phillies a couple of uh, years ago, he quit. And he said, he said once a day, he said, I'm sitting there in my million dollar house and I felt empty and horrible and I felt that I had to do something else and I don't know exactly what happened in his life personal but he said goodbye to football and he started to have small Bible classes with his um, group of people with ex-football players actually with football players not ex-football players and then the group went bigger and bigger that's what I understood about it and suddenly he had 50 people and now he has the fast growing church in, in Las Vegas Really? And he ha he, he's, he's an unbelievable, beautiful guy. I listen to him and I have tears in my eyes. And people cry because he just, last week it is his testimony there. And he just, cr he is, and he's, he's asking, well, how come that people are so in touch with this? And I'm like, and people ask you that. Why people how come people are so touched by, by what I'm doing? Because he showed his heart. That's all what is to do. He, you can show about knowledge, but if you don't show your heart, then people have never an ability to go to trust that that emotion is okay, what they feel, what they suppress, to go in the next level. Because I, I'm not like a religious freak. No, you're from Amsterdam. <laughs> like you say, the churches are empty and the cafes yes, are full. but now I'm going to church and I'm starting suddenly to do volunteer work and do all kind of stuff. Volunteer work to help the homeless? It's beautiful. It, and why I'm doing right. it, I have no idea. It, it's just change what comes and you, you go there. Wow. And yeah, I... So what a nice man, huh, that could inspire you to... Uh, get out of the, the smoky halls of the card counting? <laughs> well, I'm still doing card counting and smoky no, halls. I, <laughs> even know, though you don't smoke yourself? You no, know, it's like you just... I'm just uh, very peaceful, feeling peaceful to do something for other people. Yeah. And uh, it gives me a purpose, whatever right. that is. It's, right. I can't define the purpose, because if you really define it to singularity, you're lost. Right. Can you give your website so people can find you? I can get my... I can give my blocker yeah, but say, course, I'm, say, I'm say your blocker. My blocker Slow. is, um, let me see, I, it's, um, 
Now I have to think what my blocker address is. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty consuming here. Um, yeah, I can what was my blocker? I, did, I have it for five weeks. And I just started because I want to have it as a... Well, you can take... You, you need to get a website. Yes. Because then you can embed this. Because right. this will go up on YouTube. Right. But it's nice that you can embed it. Yeah. So well, my know. website will be... Uh, yeah, what's the name of your website? This will be ghostyourwild.com. Uh, Spe spell it out. Uh, G O S T U A R T W I L D dot com dot com and that will be running about February two thousand eight. Go Stuart Wild dot com. com. How did you ever pick the name Wild? Because it was just Wild and because well, I know you you resurrected yourself or you know. Well, I. What I what was your original name again? Paul. Paul what? Yes, Paul Bruchhausen. Bruchhausen. Yeah. That's kind of a mouthful for us Americans. But, yes, but wild, you know, wild, people will short, know. and it should be informative. You know. Yeah, and I was running a bed and breakfast for seven years in Amsterdam, uh -huh. and um, I also I changed, I changed so much because I met so much Americans, so much Canadians, so much people from all over the place, who are just smoking dope in my house, <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> that the smoke came out of the windows, that the fire department came along along with one day. Even in Amsterdam. Yeah, it's a funny story. One day I had. Australians in my house. They were barbecuing in my kitchen, and the barbecue went on fire. And I came home, and the whole fire department uh, standing in front of my house because my <laughs> my, thought, my neighbors thought my house was on fire. <laughs> that's something oh I did God, illegally. Oh God, that is so funny. But you know, I, <laughs> that's so funny. I had one day I had eleven Italians sleeping in my kitchen because <laughs> they want they want they they want to pay fifty dollar for pot, but they want to they want to sleep for free. So all of them was booked and let them sleep all in my kitchen. Oh really? My kitchen was like four by four. That's really that is so funny. Now in Amsterdam, it's it's legal. You yeah. charge you can charge fifty dollars for the pot, and then you give the kitchen free. Well, no, it was, it's not legal to sub rent your house, but I didn't care. I was. It, it, it's not legal to rent your house out. <laughs> it wasn't. It's not legal to rent my, your house out when it's sub rented. When oh, you shouldn't sublease it. But it's how I supported myself as a right. high jumper. I wanted to. Oh, as a high jumper. I mean, I had no sponsor, so I had this. this so tour. you just did what you needed to do yeah, to I get the job. Yeah, I went to the station and I had the map with pictures and I said, "Hey, are you want, do you want to stay in my house?" <laughs> <laughs> and they came and, and every, my neighbors like, "Who the hell is this guy?" And the police came. And I said, "Do you have a hotel?" I said, "I just have a lot of friends." <laughs> and they're all detached. We see each other. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. I mean. You know, you're not supposed to do that here in this city either. I, I think, you know, some people say that's just sort of a way that the hotels can kind of make sure they always have the upper hand. If if people just start opening their hearts and their homes even for free, yes. it, it could ruin business. I yeah, mean, what if people funny. became generous? Oh my God, yeah. the society would crumble then if we became generous. Exactly, and then there's no political, uh, <laughs> there's no, pol nobody is, because political power is there because people are not able to take responsibility for that what they're doing. Yeah. And yeah. if you are common sense, we should make in America needs a common sense party. <laughs> your heart is left. My heart is your heart's on the left side, right? Naturally. Yeah. So then I'm left. And but it should call the common sense party. Right. Be, and just the common sense. we all get killed probably. <laughs> but you know, I think we're all finding our way, you know, whether we're uh, Americans or Dutch yeah. You know, I think we really need to work together, and we need different viewpoints. Like, it's been very refreshing having you come by yeah. and to give me another perspective oh. that I'm now inspired to share with my viewers to say, you know, here's a strategy that they use to get something done in Holland. But I was going to say, uh, subleasing is not legal in most places that, you know, have deeds and trusts and, right. and banks and mortgages because the hotels have to predictably be able to pay their mortgages. So there, there's a reason to keep the society together. But I'm thinking, can we start to edge towards generosity? Like you're, when you're going to the church and now you're inspired to help the homeless, that the homeless, you know, as soon as they're homeless, you think, oh, these are people I don't want anything to do with. And then people say there's too many people and we've got to get rid of them because you're going to have ugly slums if you keep them in their houses. Yeah, but the but maybe it could be different if we start to share. But you know, the average, I heard the average American lives two paychecks from the street. Yeah. So, in a way, we're all almost homeless. So, I would really, right. we, we are responsible for everybody on the street, too. Because if you say, I can do anything, but you can you can give a dollar if somebody asking you, and it's beautiful to give somebody a dollar. Right. And you can miss a dollar. What is right. a dollar? You can miss a dollar? 
Right, right, right. So, um, you know. But you know, I, but still, the the most unbelievable part is the marijuana because it's so illegal in this country. Yeah, it's so know. illegal. Yeah. Do you think that Amsterdam has suffered because of making it legal? Are there more drug addicts and crazy people no. because of it? No. Not at all. It's and made there are no more difference. people who are just. It is just. Let Let's say, what is worse, being drunk or being stoned? More dangerous. Being drunk is more far more dangerous. Yeah. And being stoned, you're not going to start killing somebody. Right. But being drunk, you're gonna you don't you don't care. And I was uh, drunk one day. You got you drunk one day. One day and you only one day you were drunk. And you Good are. Good for you. I think yeah. I got drunk one day too. I think I was 16. <laughs> really? Well, you are aware that you are you are aware of what you're saying, but really you don't care. Yeah. That's the you don't tell a drunk guy who is drunk that he doesn't he or she doesn't know what he's doing. They you get know, mad. He knows exactly what he's doing. He, he, he doesn't care. You he just care. doesn't care. That's it. Huh. So it's very dangerous. I can see how you can use these insights into being a good life coach. Yeah, well, I'm you working know, on it. That, that, that makes sense to me. I think I remember my block spot thing. It's, um, <laughs> you know. Well, I think it's better to, to do go Stuart Wild. Yeah, do go there in February. That's and then you can refer people to the blogs from there so people can, can remember these things. I'm going but um, I still want to get back to, are there, would there be little old ladies um, in Holland who said, oh, gee, I wish we had the good old days when marijuana was illegal? Does anybody think it should be illegal, that the country has declined because of it being legal? No, no truthfully, I know you don't hang out with little old ladies, but well, have I you out, ever... I, I actually hang out with old ladies. You do? It's fascinating. I hang out with an old lady in Atlantic City, uh -huh. and she's 82, right. she, and I loved her. Yeah. You can love because she was sitting there and nobody cares about her, but she has, she was working for the Iron, uh, for the Embassy of America. She was an agent in the 70s. She was working in Tehran and she told me so many things how you can survive in the forest. Oh, really? She was, uh, she was 84 and you would S never expect that. So and you're a real sponge. You learn from everywhere you uh, can. That's of interesting. Course. Now, how, but, but still, how about in Amsterdam? Yeah. Do you ever hang out with anybody that, that is negative about the marijuana laws in Amsterdam? I hang out with everybody. Do, does anybody complain and say, I wish we, go, we would no. make it illegal and we would no, be a, there's no, there's a better no. society? No. Wow. And how's the economy going in Amsterdam? You are are you living two, well, s two paychecks away from homelessness like, like well they are I'm, here in America? I'm, uh, you know, I, my status is uh, worldwide now illegal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I really don't care. So what do you want to do about it? Well, my my <laughs> God, and you're not drunk either. I'm not even drunk. <laughs> well, no, but, but, but what I mean is, are they, is the economy in Amsterdam better? Is the economy you know, because you were saying, and I've heard it before, that many, many Americans are living two paychecks away from being thrown on the street, yeah, and, and they the would be homeless. Then. Yes, and the average death is that, here is, is that the average death? Is? The, average, the average death of an American is, and I think it's shocking because it's a beautiful country. I love this country. I think it gave me a lot of insight. It's a lot of opportunity. It's beautiful to live here. Uh -huh. No negativity, but. No Sometimes negativity? No. You'd I mean, no negativity that I owe this. Oh, you don't, you don't I dislike don't America? No. You like no, America? I love it. Yeah. Because for me, it's Disneyland. It's so much. It's Disneyland? Because I'm f I, if you are <laughs> able to be really free, you can, you can achieve everything in this country. But I think the real. If American you're able to be free. Really? But that's true for Holland, too, isn't it? Or you can't be so free? Because they didn't like you when you said you're changing your name from Paul to Stuart. That really bothered them. Oh, yeah. And I tell you because I heard with Mohammed with my yeah. uh, with my guy downstairs. No, it's funny. He 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 had a good story about the Dutch, and then you seem to have a little energy about this. Here, let me life coach you. What what happened when they you told the officials? Well, there is an idea that Dutch people are so open-minded, uh -huh. and I want to correct that <laughs> because it's they are the most <laughs> arrogant people I ever met him. I have well they were the original slave traders, you know. They that, are arrogant. That the, the biggest money in this country I can mean, be traced back to Dutch slave traders. Right. So they were arrogant that their white skin could enslave black skin. So that's honest of you. I mean, I mean you know, to say they're arrogant. But I mean I'm going to the Dutch consulate to renew my passport last week. And hey, what's your name? And she doesn't even want to tell her name. I'm like, 
because she's... Working. Well, she wouldn't tell her name. No, I'm from Holland, huh? you know, and I'm like, she's from Holland. She so works... You mean Dutch you asked her in, in, in Dutch? Yeah. How do you say it in Dutch, just to prove you know Dutch? Oh, well, what is your name? And, she's, and what did she say? Uh, I can't tell. No, but I'm in like, Dutch, how did she say it? I can't say it. I can't really? say it. And I said, why you can't tell me that? Because you know my name. Yeah. It, that's what I'm trying to say. You live six years in the United States, you still act like a Dutchie? Is oh, is that is that typical of Dutchies to it, act to, kind to be of kind of arrogance? It's like what, it, this is what I what, because I was a, a guy oh. who was out of the box. Now, uh, Dutch people are very open-minded. They say about we have sex and we have dope and but we won't tell you our name. <laughs> but that is that is not being open-minded. But they hate their neighbors and everything what they don't recognize they reject. So I never felt home in Holland because really? I was a guy who was out of the box. Yeah. I was standing seven years at Central Station, and in the morning. The intercity came train, you know, the intercity train full of people with, no, with with horrible faces on their, you know, surface. And then in the evening, I ca they came all depressed back, and I was still standing there waiting for tourists and having a good time. Yeah. It's just I was n I never lived in a. I never lived in expectation of what other people what you should do. Right. Of course, that's no life. But now, um, you, know? you know, one thing I love about the Dutch was I can't remember what the year was, but. Uh, mm. In the Inquisition in Spain, they were being horrible to the Jews, and Holland opened their borders to the Jews. Mm -hmm. So there is at least a political open-mindedness in oh, yeah. some cases. No, it's not like I'm all negative, but of course, I will be honest, I had some painful memories in Holland. Yeah, you know, you'll and, be honest. And, it, and that is that influence too, but I like uh, the thing is you should never judge and what's, what is not... what. If you are not able to accept something what you don't know, you should not. You should not re there's no reason to reject that. Great. And that's what I feel. I. It's so far. If I see Dutch people in the subway here, I even don't want to. You don't want to talk to them. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I already see how they. How they call me. It's like, oh no. That's funny. Yeah. It's, no, it's that's sad. funny. Because I, I remember when Vincenzo and I were in India, and when I would hear an American accent, I would cringe. And when he would hear an Italian accent, he would, we'd kind of... But I wonder if that's something that we haven't, that we're running away from. You know what I mean? Do yeah. You think, do you think okay. maybe we have to see what it is that's bothering us about our countrymen? It's, it's just a thought. Maybe it's because issues. We all have issues yeah. and we, we all are running away from our issues. So maybe the one is running a little bit harder than the other one. Yeah. Or, you know. Say, in our last, in our last minutes, um, could you talk about what type of coaching you most like to do? What's your ideal client? Do you like, how do you most like to help people? Somebody Some yeah. who is able to say, I have no clue where I'm going, but I trust myself. And somebody who understands that you can only coach when you give up as a coach, your own ideas, because you, as a coach, you get coached too by the client. So I do not see it as a uh, coach patient thing. I think we all patients, we all coaches. I believe that we are, if we are able to personalize coaching, I share you how I feel. So you can recognize that what you're afraid of, that's basically very normal to feel. Right, right. So then you can transform. Great. I think we'll have to wrap it up. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, just say one. Oh. Hello. Hi. I'm not sure who's coming up first. So let's... Vice President Dick Cheney recently warned of a new 9-11 attack. The threat to the United States now of a 9-11 occurring with a group of terrorists armed not with airline tickets and box cutters, but with a nuclear weapon in the middle of one of our own cities is the greatest threat we face. And Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff echoed the warning. All these things give me a kind of a gut feeling that we are entering a period of increased vulnerability. But are we threatened by freedom-hating extremists in the Middle East or from within America's halls of power, perhaps the White House itself? 
Is it indeed Cheney, not Bin Laden, who is determined to strike inside the United States? A new false flag event, a pretext to attack Iran, could plunge America into dictatorship and martial law, and the world into nuclear war. It's time to confront the cancer of deception and corruption within our government. A tidal wave of truth seekers is rising in America, united by purpose, not politics, that will descend on New York City and Washington and throughout the country on September 11th to honor the victims of 9-11 and its aftermath and to stop this ruthless war machine in the great tradition of the civil rights movement. And the time when the operation of the machine becomes so obvious that you're so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even possibly take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Join the new revolution before it's too late. For more information, visit actindependent.org. Vice President Dick Cheney recently warned of a new 9-11 attack threat to the United States now of a 9-11 occurring with a group of terrorists armed not with airline tickets and box cutters but with a nuclear weapon in the middle of one of our own cities is the greatest threat we face. And Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff echoed the warning. All these things give me a kind of a gut feeling that we are entering a period of increased vulnerability. But are we threatened by freedom-hating extremists in the Middle East or from within America's halls of power, perhaps the White House itself? Is it indeed Cheney, not Bin Laden, who is determined to strike inside the United States? A new false flag event, a pretext to attack Iran, could plunge America into dictatorship and martial law and the world into nuclear war. It's time to confront the cancer of deception and corruption within our government. A tidal wave of truth seekers is rising in America, united by purpose, not politics, that will descend on New York City and Washington and throughout the country on September 11th to honor the victims of 9-11 and its aftermath, and to stop this ruthless war machine in the great tradition of the civil rights movement. And the time when the operation of the machine becomes so obvious that you're so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even possibly take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, Join the new revolution before it's too late. For more information, visit actindependent.org. Vice President Dick Cheney recently warned of a new 9-11 attack. The threat to the United States now of a 9-11 occurring with a group of terrorists armed not with airline tickets and box cutters, but with a nuclear weapon in the middle of one of our own cities is the greatest threat we face. And Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff echoed the warning. All these things give me a kind of a gut feeling that we are entering a period of increased vulnerability. But are we threatened by freedom-hating extremists in the Middle East or from within America's halls of power, perhaps the White House itself? Is it indeed Cheney, not Bin Laden, who is determined to strike inside the United States? A new false flag event, a pretext to attack Iran, could plunge America into dictatorship and martial law and the world into nuclear war. It's time to confront the cancer of deception and corruption within our government. A tidal wave of truth seekers is rising in America, united by purpose, not politics, that will descend on New York City and Washington and throughout the country on September 11th to honor the victims of 9-11 and its aftermath, and to stop this ruthless war machine in the great tradition of the civil rights movement. And the time when the operation of the machine becomes so obvious that you're so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even possibly take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Join the new revolution before it's too late. For more information, visit actindependent.org. point is it was a major bestseller in Israel. It changed the views of Israelis. Every poll taken in the last five years has showed most Israelis support me over the government. And on the 10th anniversary, I was on TV four times in one week, all prime time stuff. 
And then people got really pissed at me. And first I had a stroke when Sharon had a stroke. You want, I'll talk about Sharon's a phony murder. Remind me about this, who knocked up Sharon. It was the same guy who knocked up Rabin. It was even the same hitman who knocked up Rabin. I, like a lot of people here, am very upset about 9-11 being an inside job, and certainly the evidence indicates this completely. All you have to do is look at uh, three or four of the basic facts, and it points to the government completely. So, Amir Shatrit is a person who I want to thank for getting everybody together here today in New York City to listen to one of the best authors to come out of Israel. His name is Barry Chamish. I first found out about Barry when he wrote the book, Who Murdered Itzhak Rabin, proving conclusively that the assassination of Itzhak Rabin was carried out not by the stooge who is in prison now, but the murder of Itzhak Rabin was in fact carried out by people within the Israeli government specifically. And then I read another book by Barry Chamish called uh, Shab Tzvi Labor Zionism in the Holocaust. And as somebody who is Jewish and a very strong Zionist, a Jabotinsky Zionist, I was shocked to find out that the Israeli government carried out radiation experiments in the 1950s and 60s on Yemenite Jewish Israeli children. And all Sephardim. All Sephardim. And these were children that were taken out of school and they were then subjected to 38,000 times the amount of radiation in a single x-ray. Within five or ten seconds, they received the equivalent of 38,000 x-rays with no protection whatsoever. And uh, many of these children died and the ones who didn't got cancer and had horrible sicknesses. And I guess the Israeli government did this because they wanted to uh, be in vogue with the other governments of the world like Europe and America and they wanted to find out what radiation does to people. So Barry's books are very informative. Again, his book, Who Murdered Itzhak Rabin, sold over 30,000 copies. It was an excellent book. And he's also written a lot of other great bestsellers, Save Israel, Israel Betrayed, The Last Days of Israel, and Bye Bye Gaza, as well as Shab v. Labor Zionism and the Holocaust, which is my personal favorite. So without further delay, I give you one of the greatest researchers on Israel today, Barry Chamish. Thank you. Folks, I'm going to start with 9-11 because I know that's most of the crowd here. Now, I, I, uh, I found out just a few things. I mean, let's not exaggerate that I'm a 9-11 researcher. Oh, and by the way, if my voice sounds odd, I'm going to say this at the beginning. I'm in America because a series of accidents which I decided were not accidents, happened to me in Israel all at once. It began.